to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. My guest today is my neighbor and my good buddy, Mr. Chris Mahalik. Mahalik, how are you, sir? I'm good, Menchie. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. We've been, uh, it's been a while. I haven't seen you. You've been, during the season, we don't see you very much, and I see you on the golf course once you get home, and I think that's pretty much it. You go recluse, kind of like you did when you used to play. You just don't you go stay away from everybody until it's time to go back to work. <laughs> uh, usually, yeah, usually time to catch up and relax at home after uh, after the season. So, and usually, you know, when I come to the golf course, the only time I see you, you're usually about, you know, 60, 70 yards ahead of me. So it's kind of tough to talk to you. <laughs> Hey, that's the fun part of golf, though. You know, you get out there, and it's you. If it's not ahead of you, it's on the fairway next to you, depending on what we've been doing. How <laughs> that's much, true. How that's much true been, too. How many have been drinking right. and stuff on the course? So, um, I know you like the name of the, of the show. You, you know, you're always talking about my head and I, everything else. I want you to see that I have this here for you too, Mahalo. That is that is beautiful. That is so appropriate, and it's about time. I wish they would have had that helmet when you played because I think it would have been. Much better, much more appropriate. I've put it on a few times trying to hit, and it, oh my gosh, it's so hot. It looks like a yarmulke, and it's it's <laughs> so hot <laughs> to try and wear it. So, but you know how that stuff is. They try, and, and it's good. It's lasted this long. The kids haven't destroyed it. So maybe one, oh, I should have my son wear it one day to game just to see how it how it goes. So, um, would it fit him? Uh, it might. It might fit yeah. him. But it's got the inside is one of the, you know, it's, it's so old where if you would to, the it just start to just oh, it is. It's falling apart on the table as we speak. So it's like the, that foam inside the stuff that we used to have to wear yep. when we were playing, and and before everybody had their own helmet, and everybody just shared uh, your team. You had like five five helmets for your team, and everybody just shared them growing up. Nope. Now everybody's now everybody's got their own. Well, obviously, you probably didn't share a helmet with anybody. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there was no way that anybody could fit in your helmet, but. Everybody else, you just uh, you just wore your uh, teammate's sweaty helmet when he got when he scored, he put it on. <laughs> Unlike now, where everybody's got their own helmet with their own number and initials and everything on it, and, and hashtags. Yeah, fa- <laughs> face guards and and everything. Who it was? Uh, I was Reese Hoskins when he got hit in the face. He actually had the the dual. Um, almost like the hockey mask where guys, you know, after guys take one of the chiclets, they wear that, and, that face guard with no eye shield, just a, just a face guard. <laughs> Look like a, a stormtrooper mask going up there. <laughs> yeah. And that's what, then, then it matches the elbow guard, which matches the shin guard, which matches the shoes. And right. guys are, aren't afraid now just to go diving into anything face first, right? Of course. I mean, why, why, why is there any fear? If I get hit, I, I get first base, I can wear it off any of these, uh, you know, any of these Evo shields or whatever, whatever they're wearing. And uh, they have no fear because it's going to hit that. And yeah, I know it hurts, but it doesn't, doesn't hurt as much as when you're not wearing anything. That's for sure. Your ego can take a hit, especially when guys, you know, hammer you in kangaroo court for wearing everything that to go along with your, um, your oven mitt that you slide with and everything else. So um, I, we should pull those out next time. I just grab it from the house and go here, take this and slide with this instead. Well, it's it, it's very convenient in case you have to make some cookies at second base or something like that. After you're still on a base, you could just pull out the oven mitt and you got some fresh cookies out there for everybody. So, so you're you're coaching now at the major league level, right? You've been coaching for a while, mm-hmm. and you've gone through the minor leagues and seen what what change has changed, especially at the major league level, seeing this this stuff from how it was when you were playing. How long is your podcast? <laughs> um, well, you know what? I, I, I'll tell you this. Uh, you know, things the uh, things that have changed, athletes have gotten better, obviously. I mean, they're better athletes. Um, now, does that translate to uh, better baseball players? It depends on how hard they work at their craft. So, um, you know, there's always going to be that debate of whether the brand of baseball is better, the fundamentals are better, and stuff like that. And I think it just it just goes to the individual player. How much do they they want to hone their craft? Um, obviously, I think the biggest thing that's uh, you know a difference between uh, you know especially in the last you know I've been coaching since 2010, uh, so over you know over the years of coaching, the biggest thing that's changed is has been the uh, and I know everybody knows about it. It's the analytics and uh, the use and implementation of the am- analytics into the game. Um, and I think you're, you're starting to, uh, you know, there's good and there's bad that comes with that. 
And um, so I think you're starting to see, uh, you know, you're starting to starting to see that uh, teams are realizing that the information is outstanding. It's how we uh, deliver the information to uh, to the players that makes it important and makes it valuable to each organization. How often? I mean, so you're you know you're with the Nationals right now. So during the mm-hmm. game, how much time do you actually spend watching the game as opposed to sitting there looking at a screen? A monitor of something that happened before you know how we were taught where the, you know, the best way is to see it visually how much time do you or see these guys actually sitting there watching it? i mean heck we've we talked about it guys sliding into third base and cell phones are flying out of their pockets <laughs> that, that, that was that's definitely changed that was the first one uh that was the first for me uh i remember gosh i remember when um first broke in 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 98 with the diamondbacks and and, and you know Buck Showalter was our manager. I mean, cell phones were like not allowed in the clubhouse. I mean, they were, you know, uh, you know, as soon as you came in, you turn your, you turn your cell phone off. Um, I remember having to go to him and asking him, you know, Hey, can I, can I have my cell phone on? You know, my wife's, uh, you know, uh, my wife just had a baby and stuff like that. And he's like, yeah, you can, you know, but don't be on it. I mean, I guess, I guess really the guy didn't break any rules because he didn't have the cell phone in the clubhouse. It was actually on the field. So I don't know if that would have been, you know, a violation of the cell phone rule. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, you're right. There is, you know, guys looking at, uh, you know, guys looking at the iPad, looking at this, you know, always going back and looking at things that's obviously different. You know, I mean, you know, we used to run in and check, you know, guys would go in and check from their at bat before to see if where a pitch was, they do it every once in a while. Uh, I think now that, you know, everything's uh, so readily available right there in the dugout that uh, I think players are looking at it more than than the coaches are. I think the coach, coaches are watching the game, uh, seeing the nuances that are going on out there and, and what's happening and seeing how people react. And, you know, every once in a while, we, we will, you know, we'll check to see. Uh, you know, where a guy was position wise when that ball was hit or, you know, what, what was his reaction on that? I I think a lot of times when you see coaches looking at that, that's what they're looking for. So they can use it as a teaching moment. Um, You know, a lot of times guys, you know, I think guys will go and look to see if it's balls or strikes uh, a lot of times on the iPad or if, you know, um, uh, and sometimes pitchers will, I think for, for pitchers, it can be advantageous because, if there's something mechanical going on during the game, you know, you don't want to point it out to him on the, on, on the, on the mound because you just want him concentrating on getting somebody out. But in between innings, you can go, Hey, this is what, this is what I'm talking about on this pitch here. And you can show it to him and then he has a visual and then he's done with it. Um, but it can be very dangerous because guys can run to it all the time. And, and instead of watching the game and learning what's happening right now in the game, uh, they're, they're looking at maybe swing mechanics or, or, or stuff like that, that, uh, maybe a little detrimental. You know, we've seen in hockey guys coming onto the bench, older players taking the iPads away from them, just throwing it down. Have you seen any of that where the, uh, some of the veteran guys even just look, just, just get away from this, just go focus on the game? Because, like you said, they become too ingrained of overthinking what just happened. And you've seen both. You've been a pitching coach, and now, you know, now you're, you're, you're throwing batting practice to these guys. Do they go to the older guys and ask the questions, or is it more kind of, I just want to worry about me and I know more than you type stuff? No, I think I, I, I think it depends on what type of uh, veterans you have on your team. Um, and, you know, I think it, it doesn't even matter if you're a veteran or a young guy. It's if you have a team full of leaders, if you have guys that want to lead, um, then then your players are going to gravitate to those. And they're going to see, you know, they're going to see, hey, what you know, how's, you know, last year, a great example. How does Ryan Zimmerman, you know, go about his business every day? And you can see the guys gravitate to him. And or if they had if they had questions they would go to him um on a, on a pitcher or a philosophy or whatever it was and then you would also see you know you'd see zim go and when you know one of the younger kids made a mistake or something was done that you know wasn't acceptable you know zim would pick the right time to go talk to him it might have been the next day and just go hey uh you know what were you thinking there ah this is maybe this is the way it should be done this is the way we do it here in the big leagues and uh you know make sure you pass along and you know it just depends you know guys Guys like that, Jason Worth, Ryan Zimmerman, uh, you know, Adam LaRoche, all those guys come to, come to mind that they gravitate to. 
And I, you know, it doesn't like and Trey Turner was that way. And he was a young, you know, he was considered a young kid, but he was a leader. And it just depends on that type of uh, personality that you have. Um, so I think, I think, you know, uh, they're still, they're still learning. And I, it all depends on, um, you know, like I said, the type of leader, type of uh, quality of individual you have. And I think that's, that goes in any sport. I mean, so do you, do you think it's just a lot of over analyzation? I mean, depend from up to now. I mean, you're you're a smart guy. You went, you're a Notre Dame grad. I don't know why I give you that kind of benefit. But, but do you think how, how, did, how did that taste coming out of your mouth, buddy? I'm, I think I threw up in this helmet <laughs> <laughs> to do it. But you know what I mean. Do you think it becomes just you know the thought process becomes too much? Because I know right now you guys are going through a rebuild really in Washington right now. You know, with with Soto and, and Josh Bell, two veterans. So who looking at this on that team who who was really taking a step forward to, to to take over once once those guys were gone is there anybody that's really well you know uh you know it's uh some of the pitchers have you know uh you know you got guys like Patrick Corbin um that are still here and you know he's somebody and and Pat would be the first one to tell you the season's not going the way uh you know that he had hoped uh but I you know he give him credit. He's taking the ball every day. He get every day he gets a chance. He takes the ball and he's out there and um, you know and that's something that guys look to. Um, you know, like you said, we've got a lot of young guys on our team. Um, you know, Nelson Cruz. You know, Cruzy. The guys. You know, I, I'm I'm not gonna say how old he is because I I, I don't. I, I think he's 40. He just turned 41, maybe 42. I'm not sure, but I tell you what, he shows up to the park like he's 25 every day because he's got energy. He's, uh, you know, he's a pro's pro. He goes about his business. Uh, it's the same every day. Uh, I know the routine in the cage is like clockwork and, you know, guys, guys gravitate to him to see how he does it. And, you know, and he does things the right way and guys respect him for that. So those guys, those are guys that are stepping up and the other guys are learning as they come along. You know, we got Luke Boyd uh, in the trade too. And, you know, he's been around for a little bit and, you know, he's one of the, the guys that just, you know, he goes about his business and plays the game. Uh, we've got a lot of young talent and, and, you know, it, they're, they're learning, uh, they're learning at the big leagues, some things and, 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 you know, big leagues are, is, it's a tough place to, to learn, the, to learn things. You hopefully would, uh, you know, you learn a lot of stuff in the minor leagues and, uh, you know, right now, some of them are having to learn some of the stuff uh, in the big leagues in front of, you know, in front of some pretty good crowds. Yeah. And you guys have a pretty, I mean, the staff that you guys have, there's, has got a, a you know, long track record, major league service time coaching wise. Mm -hmm. um, are the guys listening to them? And, you know, you talk about um, those guys wanting to lead. Are they, are they asking the questions as they come up wanting to learn to be better? Or is it just more of a, I'm here. Let me do what I need to do. Don't bother me. Type of type of uh, approach. No, no, I don't think they're. You know, I, those those players that have those type of approaches, they usually don't last real long. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're 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 coming up. They're uh, wide eyed. Um, they're listening, um, and it's a constant. It's a it's a constant instruction for our guys. For you guys like Bogart, P. Sarcina. You know, you got Davy. Davy's great uh, with uh, with the guys, and you know. The first thing that they, you know, the players realize is that the coaching staff cares about them and they want them to get better and they, you know, and they want them to succeed. And so it's just by going through the, uh, you know, the, the day in, day out procedure of teaching these guys the game um, and learning from their mistakes because, you know, uh, mistakes are going to happen, whether you're a veteran or you're a young guy, it's going to happen. Um, so, you know, their attitudes have been good. And, you know, and when you got, you got guys that have coached for a long time, if, if they see something that, uh, you know, that they don't like with the way, uh, whether, like you said, it's an attitude adjustment or whatever, they're going to let them know. Uh, this is the way it's done here at this level. And it's, you know, and what you're doing is unacceptable. And, you know, these, the coaching staff, like you said, there's a ton of experience here. And, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, we're going to tell you what you need to hear. It may not always be what you want to hear, but it's going to help you out in the long run. You think that comes from the minor league coaches as well that have played to help kind of filter that through? You know, you're, you're around those, especially in spring training, your your double A, triple A managers and coaching staff are usually around. And does that come from from Davey on down telling them, hey guys, you know, this is what we're looking for, the attitudes, so they're prepared and they're not just kind of just filtering them through? 
100%, you know, 100%. Davey sets the tone, he sets the philosophy for the, you know, for the organization. And then it's, you know, uh, the, the coaches, you know, uh, and player development, that that's their number one goal. You know, that that's the number one goal for, for anybody in player development. When you get a guy, you know, mention when you, when you promote a guy to the next level, uh, you know, as a coach, you, you, the, the, the thing you always, the thing you always tell, you know, you tell the coaches like, like when I was coordinating, when I was coordinating a uh, pitching coordinator, I would tell the pitching coaches, I said, you know, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't uh, measure your success on your wins and your losses in the minor leagues. You don't, you don't measure your success on your team's ERA and stuff like that. I said, your success, the way that I want you guys to, you know, value your success is if, if you promote a guy to the next level, he goes to that next level. And he doesn't stick out for the wrong reasons. He sticks out for the right reasons. He's ready. He doesn't miss a beat. He knows. He knows all the plays. He knows. You know. He knows the signs. He knows how to. You know. He goes up there, and it looks like he should have been there for. You know. For all year long. I said that's how you measure it, and that's what our. You know. That's what our guys in player development do. They they get them ready for the next level or two levels above, so that they're uh, teaching them some advanced stuff, so that when they get there, they're not overwhelmed. And uh, they, you know, they step right in, and, and hopefully they can contribute. And and that's what you know, that's what our, our player development's all about. And, and like you said, that that starts from the top down, and the expectations are there, and and this is what we expect from you. You know, we you know, you know, we talked the other day about all these managerial positions that are that are open nowadays, and uh, you mentioned Tim Bogar as you know, it'd it be a great candidate for one of these positions. Why do you feel that way? And you know, a lot of people have questions. They always, everybody wants to, they want this guy, they want that guy, they want this guy. They, he, well, he's done this, this, and this. What, you know, what, what, what do the organizations say? Or even Davey saying, you know, this guy would be a great managerial candidate. You know, what can they say or what can they do to help kind of encourage that? Right, right. Well, I mean, the thing with, uh, you know, speaking of Tim, you know, I'll speak for Tim is that you know what it's the man i mean he's just a quality individual uh aside from the baseball he gets to know his people he gets to know his players and i think if you go and you talk to anybody that's played for tim in the minor leagues or even the you know the the time that he was in the big leagues with the rangers uh when he i think when he took over for uh for wash uh you talk to the players and they're all going to talk about respect that uh, it's a two-way street he respects them and they respected him and he's a very um, he's a very passionate coach uh, when it comes to baseball, but he's not emotional. If that makes sense, uh, he's got a burn. He's probably got a burning desire inside, uh, wanting everybody to do well. But if you look at him, you would never know. You know, he's like the he's probably like the uh, uh, you know the duck on the calm water. You know, on top the duck looks all nice and. Uh, you know, nice and calm and smooth and underneath his feet are paddling away a hundred miles an hour. Well, that's Tim, Tim, not that his heart's racing like that. His mind's going like that because he's three, four steps ahead, uh, what the next thing's going on, but he doesn't want anybody to know in that dugout, you look down at your manager and he's okay. He's got it. He's, he's calm. He's cool. Let's relax and let's play the game. And I think that's the best thing, you know, as far as Tim goes, um, the way he deals with people, the way he respects people, and the uh, the way that he coaches, I, it's just uh, it, you know, if I was a player, I, I know that I, I there's no doubt in my mind that I want to play for a guy like him, and uh, he you know he's just I think he's you know if you look at his record wherever he's been he's he's been successful, and I guarantee if you go talk to any of his former players, whether it's uh, minor league guys, major league guys, whatever, they're gonna they're gonna go. Yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed playing for Tim and, you know, he respected me uh, and um, he challenged me. And I think the most important thing that Tim does is probably what he is that he's, he puts people in a position to succeed. And that's what, you know, that's all you ask out of your manager as a player is, Hey, put me in the situations where, you know, I have the best chance to help the ball club out and the best chance to, to succeed as a player. And I think he, you know, he does that. You think either way, though, so maybe a team that's on a rebuild or a veteran presence. I mean, you know, the Phillies are looking for one. They're, you know, they're right in the wild. You play them all the time. Um, here here they are. I know they got Beasley here. I'm trying to think where else there's – well, the Angels as well are looking as well. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. It's it just – what, the best fit do you think would be for him? Would it be a, would it be a younger team they're building around or something that's got there that's right on the cusp? 
I think something that's, yeah, I, I, I think either way, I think either way, but I think that, um, I think both, both scenarios would be great for him because he would be, um, as far as a young team, he'd be great at building the foundation. Um, and, and like we, what we just talked about, about setting the tone throughout the organization, what's, ex, what's, uh, expected and, and, and being the, uh, you know, being the personality or, you know, the identity, I guess you would say of the uh, DNA or however you want to say it of the organization. Um, uh, but then if you're, you're talking about a team that's on the cusp, you know, he's, He's got a World Series ring, uh, you know, with the Nationals. He's been, you know, he's been doing this for a long, long time, and I think he would be, he would know the the the, the people that he, uh, would need to get that team over the hump to say or however you want to say it. But he would bring that attitude. Okay, guys, it's it, we're expected to win, and this is how we're going to win, and it's going to be you guys. And I think that uh, either scenario, I think he'd be outstanding. In. You know, you hear all these names, like I said, thrown around for managers, guys that have never even managed or can't even coach anything, and they're wanting to bring these guys in as opposed to the guys that have been through the minor leagues, have been around, especially the guys that are in an organization that have been around and know, you know, putting in the time. You know, just as a former player now, as, as at that level, what, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Are you, are you somebody that thinks that, you know, they, to kind of really put in the time or just somebody that goes, jumps from a front office right into a major league role as a manager? Uh, again, I think it all depends on. I think it de depends on the individual. I mean, you know, what type of what type of experience do they have? Uh, you know, in in their playing career or their their baseball career, whatever you're talking about. Um, you know, because you look at some, and I mean, you look at my former college teammate, Craig Council. I mean, he's obviously had success, and he came right from the front office. Um, you know, and you look at, uh, you know, Booney, Booney, you know, Booney went from TV to, uh, to, to managing the Yankees, you know, probably one of the, you know, obviously the you know, biggest franchise there is, or, you know, uh, and he stepped right, he stepped in and, and, but again, you know, Booney's got the, the base count, uh, baseball predic pedigree with his, with his dad, his grandpa, all that. So I think it's the individual, um, but when it comes down to it, I think there's also, um, you know, there's a big learning curve if you haven't been in the dugout. And for people that, ha you know, haven't been around a clubhouse and know how a clubhouse is run, uh, how people interact, you know, uh, 162 games, you know, what is, whatever it is, 180 uh, days, 185 days, you're with the same person, same people every day. And you have to get along, you have to work with them. Um, and for somebody that's never done that before, that's not easy. And, you know, you have different personalities, you have different cultures, and this is all stuff that you learn, you know, you, you learn a lot by being in the minor leagues or, or even being on a, on a big league staff as a whatever, uh, you know, a, a base coach, uh, uh, an outfield coach, whatever it is, those are things that you learn and you learn how to manage people. And I, I, I think it's invaluable uh, especially when you're trying to get um, information and you're trying to get a player to uh, to get to get better, uh, you better you better be prepared and you better have a little experience of how to deal with somebody because you can't just walk up to somebody and give them information and then walk away. Um, uh, you have to know how to deal with that person, and I think that's stuff that comes throughout the minor leagues. I mean, when I first started out coaching and 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 in a ball in 2010, my coaching, my coaching philosophy, my coaching style, a lot different than uh, the coaching now or towards the end of, you know, when I was a double A pitching coach, 2017 coordinator, whatever it was, styles drastically changed because I learned things that didn't work and I learned what worked. And, you know, and it's timing is huge when it comes to coaching people. And if you haven't been in that situation, sometimes it's tough. And the, the learning curve could be, you know, could be big if you don't have that experience. Yeah, you're, it's, it's amazing, like you said, how it's, how it's from where you said, where you started coaching to how the game's always evolving, right? Everything changes, right. hitting, pitching. And you just, but you look now, you know, when, when you were coming, when you were playing, you didn't, you had guys, starters were going six, seven, 
innings, correct? Now it seems like they just, seem, you know, 15 wins is going to be it. So as a, as a coordinator, when you were doing that, where, what were you seeing when, as opposed to when you were coming up, you know, long tossing every day? You were, you know, you were, you were that guy out there. You were going to throw it by somebody, not really. But you were, <laughs> you were that guy to be able to, to go out and throw. You could pitch every day, right? You could be right, that right. guy. Do you see that anymore? Do you see guys throwing every day? Well, I, the key word I think you said is throwing. Um, it's gone from pitching to throwing a little bit. I think it's starting to come back to, to pitching um, uh, a little bit, uh, which is good. Uh, you know, you know when I was, the, the funny thing is, is when I was coordinating uh, with the Marlins, um, we installed a throwing program. Um, we wa- I walked in, walked in, and um, you know that was one of the first two things that they said to me. Uh, we need to throw more strikes and we need to keep guys healthy. And he kind of joked about it because about keeping guys healthy, because, you know, that's kind of who's he, you know, the, 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 uh, he, the, the uh, minor league uh, director, the okay. guy that was in charge okay. of hiring me. Okay. Um, so um, <laughs> and, and he joked about it because he knows that guys get hurt. It's part of the, you know, it's part of the territory, but you know, he, he, he was kind of joking about it. But when I showed up the first day of spring training, you know, I, there was a team stretching on a field that we weren't supposed to be using. You know, we had, you know, in spring training, you got, you know, a hundred guys there, pitchers, whatever, and you have them set up. And I walked out and there was, you know, this team was stretching on a field that we weren't supposed to be on. So I go over there and I go, Hey guys, I go, Hey, this teams are, we're stretching down on these fields here. I go, what, what team are you guys? You know, what, what is this, is it, you know, is this group a, you know, you don't say anything about teams at the first, you know, I go, was this group a B and they go they looked at me and they go, no, this is a rehab group. <laughs> and I looked, there were 27 guys. There were 27 guys in rehab with some type of shoulders arm. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. And so it was like, okay, so we put in a throwing program, got them on a, on a, on a structured throwing program, relaxed throwing program, made, it, made them start to focus on what they were doing every day and gave them a roadmap. And, and we, we structured it and limited it and, and, and monitored it. And what ended up happening, guys started, two things started happening. Guys started getting healthy and then guys started throwing strikes. And then the other thing that we did was in the minor leagues was we took off the pitch restrictions. The, the, the pitching coaches looked at me like I had seven heads the first time we had our meeting and I showed them the, the pitching, um, you know, the pitching pitch restrictions or however you want to say it. And they asked me if it was a typo because by July, you know, by the middle of June, if you were in triple A and double A, you could throw 120 pitches. If you were, if you were throwing the ball well, you know, if you're if, depending on, you know, I was, told the pitching coaches if you feel they're throwing the ball well and they're not taxed yeah let them let them get deep into a ball game because the philosophy was that this the pressure that they're going to feel in the seventh and eighth inning maybe even the ninth inning of a double a a ball game double a triple a game is going to be about one tenth of the pressure they're going to feel when they're standing on the mound in a big league stadium so let's try to get them as close to as as as, as much stress as we can, as far as that heart racing stuff like that, uh, so that they're prepared for the big leagues. And what ended up happening, we, you know, we had guys throwing 110, 115 pitches, getting pitching deep into the seventh, eighth inning. And, and also, and, and we went from 27 guys hurt to by the time I left there, there were seven guys. We had seven guys in uh, rehab and like they weren't, they were in one surgery, one Tommy John at the time. So it's like we put something behind it. We got we got back to pitching. I told the guys, I don't care how hard you throw. I want strikes. We want strikes. We want contact. And then you get a chance to put them away. You put them away. And it led to guys getting deep into games. And I mean, and you know, it was it's you know one of the guys I can two of the guys I can think of right now, Sandy Sandy Alcantara and Pablo Lopez. I think have benefited from that. Sandy's having an okay year. The other guy, uh, Zach Gallon. Uh, you know, he was traded, but uh, all those guys started getting deep into games and yeah, they got stronger as the year went on. And it was just something that um, right now it's, it's, it's taxing on bullpens that guys aren't getting deep into games. And um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because I think we need to get back to pitching and not just throwing. Is that why you're seeing more and more position players throwing now? 
when it was it was a rarity when we were coming up. Now it seems like it's every every day somebody's coming. Even if it's a five or six run game, let's just throw a. You go out there, hey Mitch, if you pitch, yeah, go ahead, go throw something. Um, is that why? Is that what we're seeing? Because of this? I think it is. I I, I think that's one of the reasons, uh, and because of. Uh, you know, bullpen, uh, you know, guys in bullpen, uh, you, you've, you've got a lot of guys that are max effort guys in the bullpen um, and they're one inning guys. Uh, so, you know, and, you know, it's, I mean, heck, guys through, you know, guys through three innings out of the pen. You know, I was one of those guys. And granted, you know, I'm not as, ta- I was never as talented as, as these guys are now. Um uh, or athletic as these guys are now, but you know the you know sometimes the the best ability is availability, and you know I, that was probably one of my biggest assets was that I was available all the time and uh, could throw every day. Some of these guys, you know, that you're seeing now, max effort uh, mechanics, uh, you know, sometimes break down over a season, and guys guys get injured. So a lot of times, I think they're just protecting people um, instead of. Uh, and I don't say I shouldn't say protect. Not like coaches didn't protect us, but they knew they had a pulse on who could do it and who couldn't. And I don't think like now, it, it just seems like uh, when you when you stretch your bullpen thin, you, you run into that situation where okay, we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna save our bullpen and we're gonna use a position player. I mean, and really think about it. I mean, like you said, it was rare and it was usually for one inning. I mean, there's some games now where it's two, three innings of position player. And you weren't, I mean, like you said, you could throw a day, but they knew maybe every fourth day or something, you'd say, hey, yeah, hey, you're not going to throw a day, period, right? You would go in. Do you see guys coming in saying, hey, I'm able to go today, or is it just kind of a show up and, and guess? Or are the, are the kids or the guys actually coming to the pitching coach saying, hey, I'm good to, get, I'm good to go today if you need me, or hey, I, I need a break? Are you seeing more and more of that, or is it, or is it still just kind of – you know, just throw them out there and then, and then see what happens. No, I, no, it's, um, well, here, here's, here's some of the things too. Um, you know, obviously it's the relationship that your pitching coach has, uh, you know, that you develop with your bullpen and your pitchers and you can tell, you know, you, you make it a, you make it a habit of every day, you know, when they're doing their throwing program, they're playing catch or, you know, shagging in the outfield, you, you know, you walk by, Hey, Menchie, how are you feeling today? And you know, great, feel good. You know, you get that. So you start to know your people. And then, hey, Menchie, how are you feeling today? You, hey, you good? Yeah, I'm okay. Right there, that tells me as a pitching coach, okay, Menchie's probably, he's, maybe he's barking a little bit today. He could use a little break. I'll probably maybe try to stay away from him. So knowing your pitchers and knowing that conversation, you know, as soon as, as, soon as it was something different than, oh, yeah, I got I, I got you for an inning today. I, I got three hitters, right? You know, I got you. I'm good. Okay. But they, yeah, I'm Okay. You, you, you hear them in their, in their voice and you can tell. And then the other thing too, is that, you know, we have all the, we have all the information. We have all the, the, the track man, the bio, the Hawkeye, everything and the body movements and stuff like that. And the strength and conditioning, you know, people have, you know, they have uh, information and uh, maintaining workloads and stuff like this. And of course there's, there's, you know, that data, data that says, Hey, so-and-so's uh, you know, they're, you know, you know, red, green, or yellow, you know, red, no, he can't throw uh, green. He's good. Yellow. Uh, you know, you can use them for an inning or, or if you could stay away from them, be great. So they have so much information and they have all these factors that are going in. So sometimes it's, you know, uh, you, you know, this guy, we think we, we've overloaded him. He needs a break. So let's stay away from him. So you're getting information from all over the place. And then it's the coaches and the managers, you know, it's their job to go ahead and say, all right, we got to, um, you know, we got to manage this and who can we use today? Who do we got to stay away from? Uh, I, I think, you know, um, you know, players, players, pitchers are, they're always going to tell you they're good to go. They never want to, uh, you know, they're never going to say, Hey, I need a day, you know, unless of course it's, you know, three days in a row and you've warmed up five days in a row, probably going to, you know, Usually when you see the guy walking a little sideways with his shoulders tilted like that, probably a good idea. Maybe give him a day off. Do you see, you know, the routines is from the bullpen. Uh, have they changed from when you were playing to how they are now guys going out fifth, sixth inning? Are they, you know, they usually walk out together. 
rookie Karen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they, it's it's still the same guys. Well, you know what? You got your guys. They, they all 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 the guys go out there together. The bullpen goes out there together, and usually you'll see your late inning guys trickle into the clubhouse, and then they'll start getting their treatment, get a rub down, whatever it is, and then they trickle out there. You know, fifth, sixth inning. But they do. They still all go out there together. They're out there for the anthem, and then you'll see them come in. And each and and the, the guys that are later in the game, they'll start getting their their treatment. I, I I tell you what, I really wish some of the stuff was around when we played, as far as health wise and 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 recovery and you know it, it's a lot a lot better than just sticking a bag of ice on your arm or jumping in a cold tub that's thirty eight degrees. The stuff they got now, it's heck. I use it as a BP thrower because I'm like, this feels great. <laughs> You're ready to go back. So you're saying so you're saying the health part of it. So I remember when we were playing with O2, Arabu, Hideki Arabu would go down to the tunnel on the west side, go out and smoke a pack of cigarettes, and then head and then head out to the bullpen. You don't see that anymore? Uh you know what? You, uh I think more hitters do that now than 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 uh than uh than pitchers. But yeah, that things have changed. There's more uh you know, a lot more protein shakes being uh being mixed in the clubhouse than when uh, probably you and I played. Um, and they, they obviously look better in the uniform than, than both of us did. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the days of smoking a heater, uh, getting ready for the, for the ninth inning, those, those things uh, have changed just a little bit. So you've been around a bunch of different closers, you know, everybody has something, something different well, these guys are just a different breed. Who's closing right there in Washington right now? Uh, you know what, Kyle Finnegan's been doing it for, uh, he's getting some opportunities for us. Um, Tanner Rainey was at the beginning of the year. Um, unfortunately, he had uh, some arm issues and it, uh, he had he had Tommy John surgery. So Finnegan's taking some of those uh, uh, closing opportunities. Uh, uh, CJ Edwards is, um, is getting some of those opportunities too. And it's kind of, it's more of a matchup right now, giving them both the opportunity to do that. And then we got, you know, and then Hunter Harvey, this uh, is the son of Brian Harvey. He's got some electric stuff and he's getting some, some weight inning opportunities uh, to close out some games. So, um, you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of it's looking, uh, you know, looking forward to next year for the, for the, you know, the pieces to uh, put that bullpen together and our bullpen's done a good job. They've, they've, they've thrown a lot of innings, but they've done a good job for us. Are they carrying, are they still doing the four, 13 or 14 or are they, how are they? Are they 13, we're at 13 pitchers now. It was 14. They cut back to 13. Um, you know, they did that for health reasons. I get it. Uh, you know, 2020, the COVID year was, you know, there was a lot of guys, you know, obviously they didn't throw as many innings. Uh, the, the, uh, the spring training, the, the, the abbreviated spring training and then start up again, you know, that stuff's tough. Uh, it's, it was taxing on guys. So I think, you know, they've done a good job of making sure that, uh, we have enough bodies down there. So that guys, we don't expose too many, you know, we won't expose guys. Um, and I think that's some of the reason why you see the position players too, uh, kind of like we talked about earlier. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, I, I laugh about it all the time because we were talking and some of the coaches were talking the other day. I said, I remember being in spring training, you know, uh, in Texas or wherever, Milwaukee or wherever, hoping to God that they say, okay, we're going to break with 12 pitchers. We're going to have, we're going to have a deep, we're going to have a deep bullpen. We're going to have seven guys in the bullpen this year. You know, some guys, it was, it was either 12 or 11. And you're like, gosh, God, I hope they go with 12. And it's, and you know, and, and again, that was when guys, you know, starting pitchers were going seven, eight, nine innings. And it was, you know, it was, it was a different type of bullpen. And it's like, I, I remember one year, I forget what team it was, decided to break with 11 pitchers, five starters, six relievers, uh, because they didn't, you know, for whatever reason, if it was, I'm, I'm sure it was an American League team um, that did that and felt like they could get by with their days off and stuff like that, that they just went with 11 pitchers. I mean, could you imagine if there was only 11 pitchers right now? I mean, it would be, I, I, it'd be crazy. I don't, I don't know if, if they'd be able to to, to do it. They, uh, yeah, I know with the season being pushed back this year. So when do the September call-ups come up? Is it, I mean, is it September 1st still, or they push it back? Yes. They push it back. You know, it's still September 1st, okay. uh, I think is, is when it is, uh, as far as, as far as I know. Um, and, um, and it's only, you can only call up two guys now. 
Really? They've changed, yeah, they've changed. They've, they've changed that. The rosters can only be twenty eight, so you can only you can only call up two players. Um, you know, and because and now and the reason why is, or I should say, your, your roster expands to twenty eight. And the reason why is now, mentioning the minor league season is going all the way is the same length as ours. And it goes till October. Okay. The, so uh, you, you still got that going. You still the double A AA and triple A still go out October. So you still have players that are ready, so you can call them up and down if need be. So this taxi squad, then. So what is? Are they considered not part of that of the call ups, or what's the deal with the taxi squad? I haven't the taxi, the taxi squad. I haven't seen the taxi squad this year. Um, it's uh, that was more of a COVID thing that uh, you you had you had last year like. We had a taxi squad. I think it's available this year, but we haven't used it. I don't think I don't think too many teams have used it. Maybe, maybe if they were going west coast to east coast or vice versa, they might have a take a taxi squad with them to have somebody there just in case because of travel restrictions and getting people there on time. Um, but like last year, what it was was there was probably uh, I think it was like five or six guys. I can't remember how many on a taxi squad. And usually it was like two pitchers. And three position players, three or four position players, uh, one probably being an extra catcher. Um, and what that was for, because we were testing uh, every day, you know, last year and in, and I think in 2020, I wasn't I wasn't there. Um, but we're testing every day. If somebody came up positive, then you know you were going to have that ripple effect of your roster being short and guys having to sit out for a couple of days or whatever. So that taxi squad was there to fill in. If, if somebody came came up positive or somebody was having symptoms and they had to go through protocol and maybe miss like just three games or, you know, sit out, get two positive uh, you know, or get two negative results back, then they're back to play. So you have those guys there working out with you, taking batting practice, doing all their drills. And then once the game started, they headed back to the hotel. And um, so that's what that's what the Texas squad was, was when you went on trips, those guys came with you. Uh, yeah. So it was kind of it was kind of tough for those guys to you know I mean you can you imagine I mean being on a taxi squad you and all you're doing is taking BP for a seven day road trip and then you go back to AAA and now you're back in the game or or even yet you know you're at, you're at the tail end of a ten game road trip in the big leagues and day eight somebody somebody's got COVID system symptoms they activate you you haven't seen live pitching for eight days and now you're you're possibly in the lineup. It, it, it was tough. It was tough for them, but you know, it was just something that they, you know, that was necessary during that time. So, you know, we were talking when we first got on uh, the <laughs> phone today, but we talked about today, we were reading that the, the union, the players alumni union sent out authorization cards toward unionizing minor league baseball players. Mm -hmm. I see being on both sides of the fence, the playing, you know, doing that and being a coach now, you know, they, they, they talked about, I guess, having a video conference today with, with the union leaders to see, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they, you know, um, you know, you're, you're a player and I'm sure you'll have conversations just to see what their thoughts are. But, you know, what, you know, what are your thoughts on all that? I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough pill sometimes to swallow because of, you know, you know, what do you do? You want them involved, but at the same time, you want them to put in the work to get, to earn that right to be a part of it. Correct. Correct. And, 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 you know, I like you, I just saw them. I haven't read, I haven't read in depth the, uh, you know, what they're, what they're shooting for or, you know, what the whole thing entails. Uh, I'll be interested to read that. It's, I, I think it's very complex, uh, especially for minor league guys. I, I don't know. I mean, obviously the landscape has changed from, uh, you know, when you and I played and, you know, gosh, we sound old. I sound old. Oh, when I played, but you know, in the minor leagues, it was, it was definitely a grind and, you know, and, and a lot of the things that, that went on in the minor leagues were stuff that were character builders. And, you know, it was, you know, it, it, when you got to the big leagues, it made it that much more, uh, satisfying, gratifying, I guess, you know, uh, you know, and it wasn't even the playing stuff. It was the stuff off the field that was character builders. Uh, where am I going to live? Uh, you know, where am I going to find a place for my wife and kids? Uh, how are we going to get there? How are we going to travel? All that stuff. And and it was, you know, it, it, it was that balance. And, I mean, you know, I would never trade it. I mean, granted, I, it, you know, 
I, I thank my wife every day for all the stuff that she did, uh, traveling cross country with two kids and, and driving um, from town to town, from towns that, you know, that, you know, no one knows where they're at, they are on the map. And, but she was there and she supported and, you know, without, you know, you know how it is, Kevin, without them, we're, we're, we're lost. Um, and what they, what they do to, to keep the family together and to, to raise the family while we're playing a stupid kids game. Um, and you know, those things are, those things that are, that I look back with and, um, you know, I wouldn't trade uh, I, I, all the places that they got to see and the, the hardships that we went through when we got to the, when we got to the big leagues, uh, it, it, it made it, you know, that much more special for everybody because we, we, we earned it. Um, and now I don't know, I don't know what the, I don't know what the end goal is with, uh, you know, the representation. That's something that, like I said, I haven't read it. So, I haven't talked to any of the minor league players or what they're looking for, um, but I know that there's been a lot of a lot of conversations about the, the playing conditions and stuff like that. And it's you know it's 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 a slippery slope sometimes. It is because you I mean you know they, they talked about the, the minor league players being more and more educated on on the process, which is great. Well, they, if they're educated on that, they can be educated on the process of what do I need to do to get myself out of here? That was like you talked about the end game was getting to the, to play major league baseball and you, you were doing whatever you could with your teammates, right? You built that camaraderie with those guys mm -hmm. and it was like college, right? You had your roommates and you're building that mm -hmm. camaraderie, but you didn't want to stay here. So right. it's almost sounds like this sounds like we're, you're basically giving them incentive to want to just stay stay complacent with where they are as opposed to wanting to earn that right to be a part of of that union um the strongest union in the world to be able to say to these guys you know we'd love you know we want you to be here but by basically by giving you this carrot we're just saying well then what's to say well i'm just going to become a career double a player i'm just gonna i like it here i can do whatever you know so then what happens you know representatives are released right because guys in the minor leagues are released every day so you know what i mean there's a lot to right. it are they part of of the player pool as far as the uh, uh the marketing stuff and everything so so that's what i mean we, we don't know that the parameters are how far it's going to go but Correct. it just seems like you're you're, you're basically make let them be complacent being in the minor leagues as opposed to like you said putting in the grind i mean we've played i was we played in pulaski virginia the, the foothills of the appalachian mountains and we i think four or five of us found a ha like a house or something they, they help you find it i don't it, we weren't living on dirt floors Oh, granted, you're riding buses for eight, nine hours. Okay, great. But the, the teams weren't going to let you just sit out there and die, right? But they were going to make you earn it, earn what you had to do. And, it, you know, even, you know, unless you were a bonus baby, right? A lot of these guys are free agents. Like, Here you go. Here's a bag of peanuts. Go play baseball. Correct. Correct. I mean, I knew, like you said, the end goal was to get to the big leagues. I knew I wasn't going to make a, a living. I wasn't going to make a career out of being a minor leaguer. I mean, granted, I I played quite a bit in the minor leagues, but what allowed me to play, you know, what allowed me to play that long in the, in the minor leagues was that, you know, I did, I, I got, I played a little bit in the big leagues and then I was able to make some money after that because I had, you know, I, I had earned it. I had pitched my way into being able to have a, have a, um, you know, a salary that allowed me to support my family and stuff like that, uh, especially, you know, towards, you know, towards the end of my career. Um, but it was always that grind that, I, you know, when I was in AAA making decent money, I wasn't like, oh, this is great. I want to stay here. No, it's like I want to get to the big leagues again because that's where the best competition is. That's w what I've strived to do. I, I never grew up going, uh, you know, played in my backyard going and pitching against my brothers going, all right, this is uh, game seven of the uh, high A Carolina league uh, championship. Hey, here we go. Base is loaded. I'm going to strike you. No, it was, <laughs> I'm in Yankee stadium on, or I'm in Wrigley field and, and I'm going to bring the Cubs a world series, you know, and that's what it was about. It was about being in the big leagues and, and, you know, and, and practicing your hall, you know, when you're, when you're 10 years old, practicing your hall of fame speech, because you think, you know, you're that good. It wasn't the, you know, it wasn't to get the, uh, you know, your plaque on the wall at the, you know, at the Modesto A's uh, and Cal League, uh, which, you know, I never planned on playing in the Cal League for four years in my career. I can tell you that, but it happened and I had to grind it out. Um, and then it just made it that much, that much better when you got to the big leagues. And I just, you know, 
it, there was never, there was never ever uh, a thought of, oh, I can make a living doing this. No, it, it, it was, I'm trying, I'm trying to reach an end goal. I'm trying to reach a dream that not everybody gets the opportunity to do. I'm very lucky to have a uniform on. I'm very lucky. I am lucky to have a double A, triple A uniform on. Um, and I, I hope to God I'll be blessed to have a, a major league uniform on someday. And that's why I kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. Not so I could have uh, housing taken care of or, or stuff like that. And, and I, I, I understand. I understand that those are, those are, those are tough things and, and, and they are, um, uh, they are stuff away from the field that are, that are burdens, but you know what? They're burdens for a lot of people um, that, that don't have the opportunity uh, to play a game. Uh, and, you know, and I tell you what, like you said, some of the towns we went to, uh, we had host families when I, you know, in, in the lower levels when it wasn't making, and you know what? They're still, I'm still friends with them to this day. I still talk to them. They ask how I'm doing and stuff like that. And if I, if, if I would, if, I would have never met them if, if that host family wasn't, you know, a part of the program. And now, you know, you see what's happening too with, you know, two years ago, they cut 40, 40 teams from the minor leagues. Now you got a lot more independent ball, um, you know, uh, and I don't, I don't know what the independent ball teams are doing um, as far as housing and stuff like that. But like you said, who, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe now, maybe all of a sudden there's, there's more independent teams and, and, and less minor league teams. I hope to God not um, because you want every opportunity you can to play for a, for a major league affiliate. Um, but, you know, that's something that, that, you know, who knows what could happen there if all of a sudden there's just independent ball. Yeah, and a, lot, and a lot of these major league teams are buying some of their minor league affiliates too. So they're actually putting that. I mean, it's a billion dollar industry. They're putting that money into their minor leagues, into their teams, you know, into the facilities to have these guys. But also too, I mean, think about it. You know, our batting cage in a ball well, it was barely well. It was barely lit. What cage? Yeah, what cage? we had it was in the mountain. And it had baseballs. So there, you know, the baseballs trickle down from the major leagues. You get, and we're at the bottom of the rung. So we're getting baseballs that have been through those tumblers three thousand times. You can't. Even, they look like the eight ball. You can't even see them. And that was just part of that motivation. I don't want to be. I don't want to be here. But I knew what it, what it took. Right? You said it built. It built that character. But you're right. But then closing these minor league teams, and now there's more guys fighting for it to, to that spot, which is what you want. You want those guys to be able to. to I, I'm willing to do whatever it is, right? I mean, especially a lot of these Latin guys, right? They come out of the Dominican. They're given. They're given nothing, right? Here's baseball. Go play, right? And this is what they're used to doing: is just playing, and that's what they love, and it, and it helps them to get to, and it just gets to that next level. Same thing, right? We we knew it was, it was a grind. It wasn't just going to be. It wasn't going to be. Um, you know, all nice and easy and everything, you know, 15 hour bus rides, you know, 4 a.m. wake up calls for flights, right? Then you're flying from Seattle to or from Tacoma to uh, New Orleans, right? Through Oklahoma City or Dallas. So, you I mean, that's the stuff, right, that, that builds character that your team, but because the guys that you came up with, too, right, you, you're doing it together. And it's and it's and it's refreshing once you guys get to that point together, you know, hey, we put in all this work, Right. This was the fun part, but then you got to you got to fight to keep yourself there, and I just uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this this plays itself out, especially asking the fifteen plus year vets what are your thoughts as opposed to the guys who were you know just getting there because we've talked on this show before about the hitting and the numbers and where it's going. I mean, it's just been atrocious, and it's and are those guys going to be are those the ones that are going to have more say than the guys that have been around? Of no, you're not going to be here long because of what you're doing. So you know that's what I mean. That, it's, it'll be interesting to see how the balance is between the, the older guys and the, and the younger guys. Yeah, it, 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 uh, I'll be watching to see how how this unfolds and what guys have to say. And you know, I'd be interested, like I said, to read, um, you know, what the what the end game is, or you know, what what they're what they're shooting for, what the goal, and and where they're trying to go with this. And you know, uh, I'm sure it's well intentions, and and we'll make a decision, figure it out when uh, we have more information. I'm sure you'll probably have a memo on your on your chair today when you get to the field. <laughs> Uh, or uh, this week, when, whenever you get there to figure out, you know, what exactly it is, because, you know, they'll have a meeting with the reps and everything yep. else just to see. But I don't know. You're right, though. I, It'll be interesting to see it. how it is and what it, what it turns yep. out to be um, and what it, what it's going to mean for the union and for baseball itself, because it's, I mean, like you said, it's a billion-dollar industry, but it just seems lately it's been taking a turn for the in the wrong direction. As from me being on the outside, you, you know, you're in the thick of it. 
being around right. these guys and just seeing. I mean, do you hear them talk about it at all, or is it just kind of? Do they just? You know, I haven't. You know, it, it, it just what you read. You know, I don't hear much. Uh, you know, from the players uh, per se. Uh, you know, talking about living situations or you know uh, the housing situations or or stuff like that. You know, I talk to the coaches in the minor leagues and uh, you know and find out, you know, what's going on, their setups and stuff like that. I mean, and, and they're even doing it for coaches, you know, they have housing, housing for the coaches. That was one thing, you know, I didn't even have, we didn't have much housing situation. It was, it was more, uh, you know, as you were coaching here, here's, here's, you know, here's a list of apartments, you know, that, that uh, you can hook something up with, you know, let us know if we can help you. And it was more of you going out and finding on your own and, 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 and doing that. And, you know, again, dealing with people. And instead of just having stuff kind of set up for you. And, um, and so it will be like, I haven't heard much about it. Uh, so, but, but just like you read the, you know, the couple, couple articles here and there in the, in, about, you know, teams raising their, their minor league salaries, minimum salaries, uh, providing housing for the players. And I think they're, that's, that's all, all good stuff. And it's all, I think it all means well. Um, and, you know, I, I think the number one thing that is, is the playing conditions for these players, for your 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 player. That's that that should be the number one thing. Having facilities where these guys can go and work out and hone their craft and get better at what they're do, what they're doing, so they can compete at the major league level. I mean, you've you've played on those fields. You've seen them. You can barely see AAA stadiums, right? Colorado Springs, man. You couldn't. It was like car headlights out there. You couldn't see anything, but. You know, you, you figured out. Hey, I, you figured I, I out pitched at Colorado Springs. I seem, they, they seem to see me pretty good there, so I don't know what you're talking about, but go ahead. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, some of these fields, you know, they're like horse tracks sometimes, right? Taking bad hops and everything else. I mean, it's just a part of, wait, it just it's more motivation to get me the hell out of here. I need to, what do, what do I need to do to get out of here, right, to be able to. Right. And when you, when you were, when you're, you know, once they start to set the teams in spring training, they you know, okay, you're going to double A. They would have a list of people of the people were to reach out to, you know, the housing aspect of it. So you so you knew it wasn't like you were just here you go, go figure it out. You know, right. and I think they're making it sound like these guys are living in, you know, below standard poverty and everything else. No, it's not. It's just granted you come in post game spreads or some P B and J's and this but like I said, it was all that motivation to just to want to get the hell out of here as fast as you could. Right. right. Well, and, and you know what teams have teams have done an unbelievable job with nutrition. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that they've made, uh, you know, that's been different. I mean, like you said, post game spread. I didn't get a post game spread till uh, gosh, it was triple A, maybe double A, maybe a couple times in double A. We get some uh, post game spreads. Um, but for the most part, it, I don't remember getting spreads until triple A. Uh, or any good spreads, I should say. But, you know, now in A-ball, they're getting post-game spreads, and they've got a budget to, and it's healthy meals. It's, you know, they're bringing in, you know, they're 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 bringing in Outback. They're bringing in, uh, you know, Carabas or, or Olive Garden for these guys to have, you know, protein and carbs, good carbs and all this stuff, and they're making, and they have pre-game spread, you know, pre-game meals and stuff like that. And so they're, I think they're, they're, they're doing a great job of making sure that they're, they're putting good food into their players' bodies, which is awesome. Um, and, you know, so their food is, their food is taken care of. Um, now, you know, it's just, like you said, it's, it's that incentive of getting and wanting to get better and better and better and get to the next level. Um, but they're, they're different motiva motivations than when we played. It was to get out of, <laughs> I want to get out of this place. I'm tired of this. I want. I don't want to share a seat on a bus. I want to have. I want to have two buses instead of just one bus for forty guys. Um, so it, it, it's definitely changed. It has. I remember teaching. You know, the, some of the Latin guys they couldn't speak any English really, and just helping them go order food. But it was. We figured out the the, the good stuff, right? To eat the healthy stuff. So you know that that was part of the. But like it almost. You talk about now. You said they they have these spreads, almost as if they're basically just doing it for them. From what it, from what it sounds like as a player of you're basically holding my hand as opposed to trying to earn it. No, earn, you know, earn that. Granted, those spreads cost fights too. You remember that people go in there and start fighting on that little table and everybody's wanting them. And then, right. right. But that was fun. That was some of the fun stuff. Cause Hey, they're going to fight today. Right. You knew it was coming. Right. Oh yeah. You know, something. yeah, they, uh, you're tired of having, you know, tired of having pizza again, or, 
you know, on a getaway day. So there'd be a fight whether we're getting pizza, Subway, or did we want to, you know, or did we want to get, uh, you know, uh, Popeye's chicken for, for the bus ride, uh, uh -huh. you know, and guys, of course, there'd always be a fight. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, but I think, I think the thing on the food, uh, but I, I think the thing on the food thing is that people started realizing that, and, and this is probably more from the business sense, Menchie, is that, you know, I'm an organization and I'm, I've, I've got a million dollar investment. I want to make sure I'm putting the right fuel on this guy, or I'm giving him the opportunity to eat correctly instead of eating McDonald's like we used to eat all the time or, you know, eating off the value menu. So I think that's, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's the old, Hey, I got a Ferrari and I'm going to put in the, you know, the, the 87 octane in my Ferrari. And I think they, they finally realized that, Hey, we can provide these guys with, uh, you know, a little bit better food. It's probably, and, and, and make sure that they're eating healthy instead of, you know, all the time we're seeing that they're, you know, they're eating food. That's not, advantageous to them competing on the field the nuke lelouches of the game because you remember too when those bonus babies would come through right the guys the your first round picks coming up and they're everybody's kind of like when are you going by the spread type of thing right they were looking for oh, them to right to to do of it course. right and that's what it, and right. same with the biglers that would come down and rehab it was expected that's that right we thought everybody was talking about the unwritten rule that you were down there that you had better because if not they were going to wear you out right oh, when you got back to the big leagues if you didn't buy if you didn't uh you know, you went down on rehab and you didn't buy them a spread down there, didn't get them, you know, like you said, outback, some steaks, something. Uh, you you were getting you were getting fined way more in the big leagues by your teammates than what it was going to cost you to buy a spread down in triple A. And and it and it got up there in a hurry because you, somebody in triple A or somebody in double A always had a friend, you know, played with somebody in the big leagues and it was a quick phone call. Hey, you know, Hey, and I'm just using it. Hey, Menchie didn't buy us anything, you know, or, or even better. Hey, Menchie bought us some Domino's on $5 pizza night. You know, that, that didn't fly over real well either. Um, so, and that was coming yeah, through a kangaroo court too. They were definitely going to find that way. Oh, no doubt about it. No, there's no doubt about it. Well, oh, well, I was, I mean, gosh, I was, I was playing now. You see what Scherzer got the guys in. Um, I can't remember if it was in Syracuse or Binghamton when he was, when he did a rehab down there. Now, what did he end up getting? I, th I think I read uh, something. About he, he got everybody on the team uh, Apple iPods, the new iPod or i i uh, uh, yeah iPod Pros or whatever. Oh, the earpods. He got everybody on the team. Yeah, AirPods. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. They probably don't have it. They're probably looking for the food more than anything. Well, yeah, well, you know what? I don't well know because the food they got good food now. So he oh yeah, got, true. I mean, I mean, that would have been like, you know, that would have been like back in the day, somebody coming down and uh, getting everybody, you know, our PlayStation 2s. That would have been nice to sit on my chair at one of those things. And then, but, yeah, then the problem is they get on there and then you have guys that go through there grabbing them, stealing stuff and, and running <laughs> and, and running off of them and trying to and going off and to sell them and everything else. I mean, exactly. But that was the fun times of the minor league ball of, of just the travel, the, the different cities, the towns that you would, would never even think about going to to visit just you know, but it was fun just to to be there to see the nuances of, of stadium. Oh. I mean, did you play in double? Was it double A Chattanooga that had the camels? Is oh yeah, double A Chattanooga. I was in Huntsville. Yes, I was in Huntsville, and we played in the old Chattanooga Stadium, and they had the camels out in center field, and the the camels had helmets on them because I think uh, Peta complained about them, so they put baseball helmets on them to protect them from home runs, I guess. Um, and so they were out there and God, they stink. I mean, it was, you know, summer in Chattanooga as hot as can be. And when you're out there shagging and you're like, man, what's that smell? And it's the freaking camels and they're just, oh God, it was unbelievable. But yeah, I mean, I, the minor leagues were, there's stories down there. I mean, you talked about bus rides. I remember, I remember I was in, like I said, I was in the Cal League for parts of, was it three, four years? Uh, I remember being on a bus and we were driving back in the middle of the desert and <clears throat> driving back to Modesto and the bus driver, uh, bless her heart, you know, and, 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 you know, bussy. and back then, what's it? The bussy. <laughs> just, yeah. Just bussy. Uh, as everybody would yes. tell everybody. <laughs> bussy. Yes. And, you know, back then it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the big, big buses that, you know, big companies that it was Old the Durham. local bus company that, you know, the, the, 
like our guy in double a he owned the bus it was his bus it wasn't you know it wasn't champion bus company it was it was bob's bus you know and he was he parked it at his house and he would drive us around all the time um so this bus in modesto we're driving and back home middle of night and getting ready to pull into a gas station and she runs out of gas i'm talking about maybe 200 yards from the gas station and it's a little bit of an incline. We can't coast in. She's we're we're stuck on the side of the road. So we got out and we pushed the bus into the gas station. Pushed it 200 yards into the gas station, and then, I mean, and it it's California desert summer, smoking, and we're dripping wet. So then she gets in there and it's a diesel. And, you know, this was 19, whatever, 94, five, six, seven, pick your year. I'm not sure which one it was, um, but uh, <laughs> we get, we push it in there and we're like, all right, great. And she goes, well, it's a diesel. So when the diesel runs out, I have to bleed the lines in order to refill. So it's like an hour of process to bleed. I don't, for this bus to do this. So we got it sit there for like an hour we're like are you kidding me we look across the street and there's a um a casino an indian, a res, uh, indian casino right across the street you saw 20 guys 25 guys walking straight across that street we spent an hour and 10 minutes over there uh in air conditioning playing blackjack while we were getting our while our uh um <laughs> our bus was getting filled up with diesel and then all of a sudden and then, you know this was back before cell phones manager comes in he's like all right bus is ready let's go bus was out front in front of the casino we all walked out and you know we pushed the bus and i think like we all made like 60 70 bucks back then which was you know a ton of money to us we were all excited we, we actually gave the we actually gave her some money for uh breaking down because we all won at the, <laughs> at the casino <laughs> <laughs> those weren't the sleeper bus. Those are the Bull Durham buses that you were. Yeah, Bull Durham buses where you could, where the windows slid open like sideways, not up and down. They, they slid sideways, and you could like kind of rest your elbow out the out the window. You know, one of those types of thing. That was the air conditioning um, at the time. So, um, and, and that happened to us in Huntsville uh, one time. The guy we uh, we were leaving from uh, we were leaving from Knoxville, going who knows where. And um, we're, we're on the highway for 10 minutes and we're in the back playing cards. And all of a sudden the back of the bus just starts, it's filled with smoke. I mean, it's coming up from underneath and we're screaming we're like the bus is on fire. The bus is on fire, pull over. The bus driver looks and he sees all the smoke. He pulls over the side of the highway and we all go flying off because we're like, we're in the back here and this thing's on fire. It's going to blow up. We get off and we're all, you know, standing way far away from it. Bus driver, like I said, Bob, he gets down underneath his bus and he's looking underneath there and looks and he goes, I don't see anything. Let me know if it happens again. Come on, let's go. We're like, what? <laughs> and sure enough, we all got back on the bus. He goes, ah, I think some oil dripped on something. Don't worry about it. Let me know. Dude, we got right back on the smoking bus and took off and then the smoke never came again. It was like unbelievable stuff that we that we would go through oh my goodness those are those were the times right and then you always had the bathroom the guys that were playing cards back there right it was if you went to the bathroom back there you were never going to hear the end of it right so if you had to go you better hold it you oh you held it oh unbelievable that was the number one rule and and then if you if if you if we found out that you were doing something in there that you weren't supposed to be doing you pretty much spent the rest of the trip in there. We locked you in there. We wouldn't let you out. And again, no air conditioning in there. So it, it smelled real good. And uh, they usually quickly learn their lesson. Yeah. Cause that motor back there was just making all oh. kinds of noise. They couldn't, they couldn't hear anything. So yeah, that was, right. Oh, those, those were the days. You missed well, now I, I'm sure I, everybody I'll, give, has you, I'll, give, you, I'll give you one more quick bus story. We were in uh, Medford, Oregon, uh, short season, first year of pro ball. And you talk about, we had 13 hour bus ride to Boise. We played a night game. It's great scheduling, played a night game, then jumped on a bus and drove 13 hours to Boise and then played that following night. You know, don't be afraid to have a day game or anything, but no. So we played, so after our game, we had to get right on the bus. The booster club 
excuse me, the booster club provided dinner for us because, you know, like you said, we didn't, we never had meals after games. So the booster club there cooked a meal for us, cooked burgers and stuff like that. Well, I think our game took, was a little quicker than they decided. So they were scrambling. Well, needless to say, the burgers weren't cooked um, probably as long as they should have. So about, uh, probably about hour 10 of the bus ride, it was like that scene from Bridesmaids when they were in the uh, bridal uh, trying on dresses. It was not a good scene on our bus. And dude, it was unbelievable. It was just guys i would never seen anything like it it was so bad and then we pull in after 13 hours here's the thing after 13 hours we pull into a pull into our hotel we go in guys are just you know guys are feeling terrible just from one the bus ride and from eating the food and then we get there so the bus he's got you know we got five six hours before we got to get on the bus and go to the field Boise, Idaho, middle of summer, 100 degrees out. He doesn't go clean the bus. He doesn't go flush out. Oh. The we get on that bus, <laughs> and guys started getting sick again from the smell. It was we had everybody was in the front of the bus. We had all 30 guys like in the first 10 rows sitting on each other because nobody wanted to go sit by the back. Oh my goodness! You, oh, those were the day. <laughs> We were wearing him out. We were going, what are you doing? You got to get this thing clean. Oh, well, I didn't know where to go. We're like, who cares? Find somewhere. Oh, the heat from, the, especially in the motor in the back, just marinating that, oh. just pushing it forward. Oh. So, yeah, you had to be brave. And that's why it was usually the older guys that sat back there. So you went back there. They didn't want to deal with it. The uh, yeah. up, <laughs> up here. And especially if they broke. That's where they were really. Because oh. you'd go up there, look, Skip, we got to get off now. Why? Yes. You know, yes. What's wrong? And or if he's sleeping, leave me alone. <laughs> or you put one of the, like you said, you put the rookies or somebody back there and make them sit back there. You did it. You yes. stay in here. Yep. Yep. He almost uh, had to have permission. What are you doing? Going in there? Yeah, you, yeah. No. Uh. Uh-uh. You wait. You wait for another two hours or something. So yes, exactly. You can hold it. Yeah. So well, Mahalik, man, I appreciate you jumping on today. We uh, getting on here and just talking and catching back up. And uh, like I said, good luck finishing out the year with them. And as we get back, we'll play some golf. Uh, and I'll try and out drive you a little bit more. We'll, we'll see if we can, we can share a few yeah. rounds or whatnot. You know, we'll have our, we have our golf thing coming up here soon too. So that's always When's a good that? time together. What do you got coming uh, up? Sometime in October. Our alumni. Oh yeah. Yes. And alumni yes. for Jack. So, so yes. yeah, okay. that'll be fun. You get back. So hopefully the yeah, season, I don't awesome. even know when the season ends sometime in October uh, now, right? I, I can tell you August 5th. Uh, <laughs> or, I mean, October 5th. I'm sorry. October 5th. <laughs> October 5th is when it ends because I, yes, it will be, um, an extra week i think we uh extended it because of the lockout so oh, okay it'll be home a little bit later hopefully the tournament's uh the following week i think it's like the week. uh that's a i think it's three weeks after that something like the 21st okay. or something so okay cool so yeah cool. well so, yeah. i look forward to it absolutely man. i appreciate it, it. and we'll uh, i'll be in touch man thanks anytime Chris. brother yes anytime sir man. you uh you know anytime uh you want to bore your uh listeners or anything like that just give me a call back and we'll talk some more Absolutely, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. All right, right, man. See you. All right, talk to you.